West Hills Tunnel, Kings Norton. Written and read by Nick Martin. Mention canals and all the descriptions that you might use about the glorious countryside, tranquillity, fresh air, peace, gentle beauty, and so on, all fall over when you encounter a tunnel. Yet they are magnificent structures, and going through a long tunnel in a boat is quite the most extraordinary experience. The canal winds its usual merry way through the English countryside and suddenly ends with a semicircle of black edged with an arch of stone or brick. You have seen it on the map and you know it's coming, but it's still very abrupt. Here our beautiful canal stops being beautiful and disappears into a hill for over a mile and a half. As we slowly approach the gaping hole, only slightly larger than the width and height of the boat, the front headlight goes on. I know it is on because the little indicator lamp says so, but there appears to be no sign of light up front. We creep further into this strange black tube, and as the daylight behind us fades away, our eyes acclimatise to the darkness. Then we see, around the front of the boat, a magical horseshoe of light dancing on the tunnel walls. That's our tunnel light, lighting up a little bit of the tunnel. Its effect is quite unlike a car headlight that turns night into day. The tunnel ahead is still very black, but we can now see a section of the tunnel wall as the front of the boat passes underneath. A wonderful arc of brickwork lights up before us and is constantly replaced as we motor forwards. I suppose two hundred years ago, when each brick was first laid, they were uniform in colour, but now they range red to orange from years of decay, to black from the days of steam, to white from calcium deposits leaching through the ground above us leaving little bursts of miniature stalactites glistening with water. The boat chunters on, and the flickering, fiery ring of light constantly precedes us and vanishes over the boat. Brick after brick, drip after drip, we are now deep underground. A look behind, and the hole we came through is still there, but seems nearer than it should. That means we have a long way to go, and no sign of the exit hole yet. But wait, there is a tiny light up front, something like a candle. It doesn't look white enough for daylight, so can't be the end of the tunnel. So it is either the back of a boat, a long way off, or a boat coming towards us, a very long way off. Five minutes later, and it looks no bigger or smaller. Well, that's canals for you. Nothing happens terribly fast. Later, it does become clear that the light is getting bigger. Sense of distance is poor in a dark tunnel, but at some point it seems we will have to pass an oncoming boat. We slow right down and move over, holding a steady line, hugging the right tunnel wall, curving close above our heads. The light now gets rapidly bigger and we hear the rattle of their engine. Their boat squeezes through the tight gap and as it goes past, a man's voice from somewhere in the total darkness calls out a monotonal, matter-of-factly, How do? Then a tiny round white light appears in front and looking back the hole we came through has apparently sealed up. We are moving forwards, and yet the light remains tiny. I am pleased about this. Its murky blackness, damp chill, and exhaust-tainted air are not the stuff of classic delight. But I like it down here, and I want to savour its alternative beauty for a while longer. As the never-ending ring of light goes before us, I wonder about the toll of the men who built this amazing hole, about how they kept it straight, 
about the problems of simultaneous excavation and the making of the brick arch, about getting the vast quantity of spoil out and the materials in to such a dark, muddy place, propped up with temporary rickety timber scaffold. The working conditions must have been appalling. How did they see in that filthy, dank blackness? Then all those thousands of bricks that had to be made and carted to site, and a supply of freshly mixed lime mortar had to be constantly fed to the bricklayers on the front line. That by itself was a mammoth operation, when you think they had to first construct the giant lime kiln, cart the limestone, cart the coal, or make the charcoal, fire the kiln, crush the resulting quicklime, and then cart that to site for mixing. The really great tragedy of it all is that they must have truly believed that this tunnel, like the rest of the system, was going to be part of everyday life for a long, long time to come. But within just four decades, the railways became established and were taking the trade away from the canals. Where once the canals seemed the answer to the efficient transport of heavy goods enabling Britain to lead the world with industrial-scale production and innovation, the new railways now offered something unimaginably more efficient and, crucially, could provide fast transport for people too. The canals were a stepping stone that enabled the Industrial Revolution that quickly jumped on to the idea of the railways that swiftly pushed the canals under and into history. Yet here we are, two centuries later, still gliding through our magnificent tunnel, and the distant glimmer of daylight is clearly now the exit portal, and the sunny day is trying hard to push its way in as far as it can, faintly lighting up the ever-shortening brick tube. Then, as if our speed was increasing, we were very quickly out into the familiar world again. Sunlight, trees, fields, birds, and the sight and sound and warmth of life once more. Looking back, we see the modest black semicircle that says so little of what lays behind it. <laughs>